Hello and welcome to the Owl Hoot podcast with me, Caroline Norbury. In each episode, I chat to amazing guests with way more expertise than me on topics covering the environment and sustainability. You'll get to hear the facts on climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution, as well as discover the fabulous actions that individuals and organisations are doing to mitigate and adapt to our changing world. I don't know about you, but I find it reassuring and hopeful that there are so many capable people out there doing great things for our planet, as well as inspiring me to get on and do my bit too. So without further ado, let's get on with this week's episode. On today's episode, Charlie Lamarcond is my guest. Charlie is the Data and Information Officer from the Mammal Society, a charity keeping track of British mammals, informing conservation efforts and collaborating with the public and other professionals to restore populations and re-establish ecosystems. Charlie joined the Society in 2019 following her academic studies, a zoology degree at Swansea University and a Master's in Ecology, Evolution and Conservation from Imperial College London. Her research covered hedgehog distribution in Guernsey, how foxes use habitat in urban parks, and the impact of urbanisation on biodiversity. I'm eager to discover more about the current predicament of mammals and possible strategies. Welcome, Charlie, to the podcast. No, thank you for having me. (laughs) No, it's my great pleasure. So I'm going to start by asking you, uh, tell me a little bit about your research that you did before you joined the Mammal Society and how you came to decide to be part of the Mammal Society. Yeah, sure. Um, So yeah, I've always been interested in wildlife and particularly mammals. Um, And I first moved to the UK when I went to Swansea to study zoology. And before that, I um, was living in Guernsey. And um, yeah, really still really loved what I was doing and was lucky enough to study hedgehogs for my third year project. So I went home to do that and looked at the distribution of hedgehogs in Guernsey. So I was setting up hedgehog tunnels, which you might have heard of, where you kind of put um, a little bit of food in the middle and some charcoal paste. um, And then they they walk in, tread on the, the paste while they're eating the food and then go back out and leave footprints on the way so you can you can see that you've had hedgehogs and that's a way of detecting them so I was doing that and also getting sightings in from the public and and things like that and it was really nice to kind of see everyone get behind the project everyone was really keen to tell me about their sightings and and that was that was really cool and it's something I still get to do in this job I hear from people who have seen things in their gardens or want to to know what they you know what this sign is is from and that kind of thing so that that's really cool um and then after that um I went on to do um ecology evolution and conservation at Imperial College London on their Silwood Park campus which is like this beautiful campus with you know lots of forest and foxes and rabbits and deer about so that was that was really cool and um yeah I looked at um one of them was looking at foxes in urban parks so I was putting camera traps out in Hampstead Heath um, and also Regent's Park and then looking at um, which cameras had foxes coming through, whether um, the kind of amount of footfall you got in those areas um, changed, whether you were likely to see the foxes coming or not, and the amount of kind of habitat cover. So was was there a lot of bushes around or trees or was it quite open and that kind of thing. So I was looking at habitat for that. After I finished my degrees, I headed back home. I was kind of thinking about what to do next. Um, I did an internship with the Guernsey Biodiversity and Education Officer, Julia Henney. Um, which is really interesting. So I was looking at um, helping with some information material on one of our Ramsar sites um, around Herm, which is one of the other islands um, in the Channel Islands. And then I actually became a news news reporter for a little bit. <laughs> I joined the local newspaper. Um, but that was really cool because I got a lot of the kind of environment and conservation um, stories and it helped me kind of improve and um, kind of turning science into something that the general public can read about. And um, got to do lots of cool things I saw a few seal releases and interviewed Chris Packham when he came over for our bio blitz so that was quite cool (laughs) that was an exciting day Um, and then I was also the zoology section secretary for our our local sort of science and natural history and um, family history and that type of thing society called La Societe Genesies so I was getting people interested in doing um, bits to do with zoology started a, a natural history book club and things like that 
and then saw this job for data and information officer advertised and thought that sounded like my perfect kind of job so applied and got it and moved back to the UK so yeah that's how I kind of ended up here. <laughs> that's really cool uh, and it sounds like you're doing something that you really want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah definitely it's really exciting to be able to do this kind of thing as a job. <laughs> yeah <laughs> for me. sure. Yeah. So, so tell me a bit about um, the Mammal Society. How did that uh, get going in the first place? Sure. Um, so the Mammal Society was established in 1954 and it was very much a kind of academic society and um, a place where different mammalogists could come together and talk about their research and find out about one another's work, maybe collaborate and study um, you know, the mammals of Britain and, and find out kind of what what was going on, how they were doing, and that type of thing. And you know, science is is still very important to the society, and a lot of what we do is very kind of with evidence-based research behind it. Um, but we are kind of trying to branch out from that, you know, solely academic society kind of thing now, and you know, getting much more involved with um, you know the general public and and trying to generally just be um, the port of call for information on mammals. So uh, it's exciting to see the society kind of develop. And what's your specific role within that? What is your kind of day to day activity? Yeah, so um, we're quite, although a national charity, we're quite a small team. So we all muck in with a lot of different things, myself included. So um, you're probably most likely to come into contact with me if you ever send in a general inquiry or anything like that. I monitor our, our general inquiries account and info at the mammal society.org. So I speak to people about things they've seen, helping to ID things they might find in their garden, whether it's an actual mammal or signs like a footprint or droppings. I think I get so many pictures of droppings through my <laughs> through my email, it's quite unusual. Um, <laughs> good fun trying to ID everything. Um, and yeah, just, you know, you might hear from students who want to, to research mammals for their projects or different researchers or things. So um, I speak to um, a variety of different people. Um, I also work alongside our science officer, Dr. Fraser Coomber, on our science projects. So something we've worked a lot on at the moment is the National Harvest Mouse Survey. So I've been speaking to people who are interested in volunteering and putting them in touch with coordinators and trying to find some coordinators around the country to, to help um, do the surveys that we want to do across the country. So that's been really interesting. I also manage, we have a tool called EcoBat online, which is for people who sort of do acoustic recording of bats. So they go out at night and record bat calls and then have all this data about the different species they recorded and how many times they passed. Um, but it can be quite difficult to know what a pass means because just, you know, you might have 10 passes, but you don't know whether that's 10 bats or whether it's the same bat just getting really excited and going round and round. It's, it's a way of trying to provide context to that so they can upload their data and then there's all these other records in the database from, from other, other people who have gone out and recorded and it sort of compares your passes to other people's. So, you know, if somebody else, you know, if you, if you recorded 10 passes, maybe, maybe someone else recorded 100 somewhere else. So actually yours is quite a low number or maybe it's a high number for your area. So, um, yeah, it's kind of trying to provide context to those, those sightings. So that's really interesting to be working on. And I've made a few different apps for that recently. So just yeah trying to trying to improve them all the time um, and then I also help with our events so things like the conferences that we've got going on and they were, we had a virtual one this year and it'll be virtual again next year so that's been an interesting new challenge and it's quite cool because it, it's a way for people who maybe wouldn't necessarily come in person for whatever reason to to be able to just join in from the comfort of their home so it's nice to be able to reach kind of a wider audience with that. Yeah, I think um, it's funny how actually there, there are there are always upsides to really bad bad downsides. Um, yeah. but I think being able to reach people with information mm -hmm. has yeah. has become a whole lot easier, and everyone has just become or lots of people have become so familiar with accessing really good information via Zoom. <laughs> yeah, I know. So we've all got very good at Zoom, haven't we? <laughs> yes, it's a plug for Zoom. I wish I was getting paid. <laughs> Um, just to be really clear then, so obviously it's the Mammal Society. For anyone that's not entirely sure what a mammal is, could yeah. you define that in the first instance? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question because I feel like, you know, it's, for a lot of us it's been a while since we did biology at school. You yes, <laughs> you kind of what? make that assumption. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so the word mammal comes from also the, the order mammalia 
which, which is the kind of group that contains all these species that we call mammals. And one of the main distinguishing features is that their young are fed milk from a special mammary gland from their mum. So that's a, a good way of kind of distinguishing whether something's a mammal. They also usually <laughs> give birth to live young, but there are some, again, it's, there's almost always exceptions to these things. Um, so monotremes like echidnas and duck-billed platypuses don't. Um, another thing that mammals often have is hair. Um, that's another typical feature, but again, um, some species don't. So whales and dolphins and porpoises, cetaceans is kind of the general word for those, um, are also mammals. Um, but some whales don't have hair anymore. Sometimes they do in the fetal stage, but you know that's again another exception to the rule. Um, so there's a few other bits like that. So I think there's also um, the lower jaw is hinged directly to the skull in mammals, whereas other groups, sometimes it's, it's like separate bones that join it. So there's all sorts of little bits like that, but those are the, the kind of main ones to help ID them. And in terms of the society itself, are you concerned with all of the mammals or, or are you picking out particular species that are maybe at risk? How do you decide on which ones to look at? Or do you, as I say, do you look at them all? Yeah, it's hard because it, I mean, yeah, you are kind of sport for choice. We have quite a lot, <laughs> quite a lot of mammals. We've got, um, what is it, 47 natives and 58 land species. So like, yeah, there's lots to choose from. Um, so we, we do co like collect records and data on all of them. Sometimes, like, for example, with the Harvest Mouse project, we might have a project that focuses on a specific one. So, for example, with that one, following our red list, we kind of realised that we're actually lacking quite a lot of data on the Harvest Mouse. Um, you know, maybe as a very small, elusive species, you don't get so many records on them. So it's kind of thinking like, right, well, we need to maybe focus on trying to build records on this particular species so we can get a better idea of them. But, yeah, we do collect data on, on all all the mammals that you find in Britain and then that informs some of our, our work so for example in 2018 we did a review of the population and conservation status of British mammals so for that it was we went through every mammal and the same with when we did an update of the atlas of Britain's mammals for Great Britain and Northern Ireland so again it's kind of you've got information on all the animal, all the mammals in there so yeah we we do but then yeah you tend to get the project sometimes focus on a group or so we know, uh, or lots of people are aware, that biodiversity is, is, is problematic at the moment and we're losing species. How, what is that like within the, the mammal group of, of species? Is, where are we seeing losses? How bad is it? Yeah, so yeah, we are seeing yeah, losses. So as I mentioned, we did do a red list recently. So that was published in 2020 and it was the first time that one had specifically been done on British mammals with the IUCN guidelines. So whenever you see, you know, in, this is endangered, this is vulnerable, this is near threatened, that's often come from the red list that the International Union for the Conservation of Nature produces. And they have a set of guidelines that tells you exactly how they make these assessments for species. So we basically went through with specifically British mammals and, and applied those guidelines to get this red list. And we did it for Great Britain, and then we also did it separately for England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, but I'll just talk about Great Britain for now, because otherwise it'll be a while. So out of the 47 native or formerly native species that were assessed for Great Britain, we found that one in four of them was threatened with some degree of risk of extinction. So whether that was you know, endangered, critically endangered, vulnerable, near threatened. Um, so yeah it's quite that's quite a lot that's a quarter so there's a lot of species that need our, our help really and what is the main reason or uh, uh this may be maybe too complicated a question <laughs> but <laughs> it, are there is it like oh if only we did this that it, that, that'll help <laughs> them across the board what, what is the, what's the main reason behind these these species being dropped off a cliff in terms of numbers yeah, so it's, yeah, as you say, it's it's a tricky one because often there's, you know, it depends on the species, but also lots of different things can affect a species. So it's really trying to identify all these different problems. So um, one that affects quite a few is habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. So whether their habitat completely disappears or it changes, so it's no longer suitable, or we get this fragmentation. So for example, you might get some big roads are built and suddenly you've just got small pockets of habitat that they can't get between um, and then you get things like 
you know, the populations can't mix. So you get inbreeding and they're more susceptible to disease, or maybe there's not enough food around anymore. There's not enough shelter sources and things like that. So that's a really big issue for, for a lot of species. And then, you know, there's, there's a mix of other ones. So changes in, in farming practices, or even just the way we garden, actually pesticides can be a real issue for mammals. And, you know, if, if what they're eating has pesticides in it, you know, then it accumulates, for example, maybe slug pellets, you know, you, you then get hedgehogs come and eat the slugs and suddenly there's a lot of slug pellets in hedgehogs and then that's obviously a, a problem for them. So, um, yeah, that can be an issue as well. Talking about the roads, there's also obviously road casualties themselves. So again, that's something that affects hedgehogs quite badly, but um, it's not uncommon to see things like foxes, badgers, different species of deer. Um, it can be a problem for bat species as well, because you've got the noise and also the light pollution um, that can affect them and where, where they can forage. Um, so there's all, all sorts of reasons. Um, one of our critically endangered species in Great Britain is the wild cat, and that one has an issue with it can it can breed with domestic cats so suddenly you've got this inbreeding problem where you don't actually know how many wild cats are still wild cats or how many of them have a bit of domestic cat in them which is another another problem that sometimes affects them so oh that's curious I I, I tended to think that wild cats were something that we didn't actually see that much of in the UK uh, in in Britain are there are there larger populations somewhere the wild of the wild cat in Britain they're they're all up in Scotland now and they're quite small populations now and as I say there's a real problem with not now it's it you can't really tell if you're looking at an actual wild cat or whether it's a, a hybrid between a domestic cat and a wild cat because they can look so similar you get the same sort of thing actually with um polecats and ferrets so they can also interbreed so you get these kind of polecat ferret hybrids and they again can be quite difficult sometimes to tell without actually DNA checking them or whether you've actually got a, a true polecat or whether you've got a hybrid and things like that. So um, it's a tricky, a tricky problem to get around when you, you it's something you need to test sometimes to even know. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely sounds um, yeah, mm. complicated. <laughs> um, <laughs> but all the all the reasons that you shared with us it are they're all man made, aren't they? They're all human related impacts. I'm um, from what you've said. Yeah, yeah, quite a few of them are, yeah. Oh, um, darn. It's, it's, yeah. It lays at our feet, that responsibility. Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to get around that. Yeah, I guess the upside of that is we can do something about that. Yeah, you, you'd hope so. There's definitely ways that, you know, we can we can try and help and kind of reverse the problems that we've had. Um, and things like, uh, you know, ones where persecution by humans is a problem you think well that you know those are things as well that can be changed or even have changed there are species that have you know maybe they're not do, you know they're not doing so well yet but they're doing a little bit better than they were because they're not being so persecuted or there's laws protecting them now so it's just looking at the you know what can we do to sort of reverse these effects and yeah as you say because they're human made you think maybe it's it's you know not all is not lost maybe there's you know ways that we can do something to help yeah. So within the, the Mammal Society itself, uh, how much of the objective of the society is to, to be monitoring and how much of it is to conserve or to be to have a positive impact and trying to reverse these losses? Mm. So a lot of what we do is on the kind of looking at the data side um, and, yeah, you know, getting these records in. Um, you know, using all these, you know, phrases very good on the models and the mapping and everything to kind of get the this information that we can then use to sort of advise um, and, you know, yeah, come up with these kind of, we've got, um, you know, handbooks, conservation handbooks for things like bats and dormice and that, that type of thing and, and creating those things that people can then use as a guide to help with those kind of things. Yeah. So, yeah, it is, it is more on the monitoring side because that, because I guess that information is so important, you know, that's kind of, what you need really to know how you're you're going to conserve something you know it's really important to know how are these how are these species doing how you know are they are they increasing are they decreasing if they kind of stable you know stabilize a bit why might that be um you know how's their population changed how's their distribution changed you know without all this information it's difficult to kind of come up with constructive conservations you know exactly how to make 
you know a good a good difference yeah yeah and i think um you've made a really good point isn't it we absolutely must know where we're at in order to think about how we can solve issues that arise from the data that you've so carefully yeah. produced in terms of collecting the data how easy is that to do uh, i know that you have an app uh, mm -hmm. and you have other organizations also collecting data where do you get most of your data from is it changing with technology mm -hmm. yeah so um for example when we did the atlas so that was probably the most recent thing with a lot of data in it that's been produced we would have got the data from you know things like yes our, our mammal mapper app uh, we also have an on online recording form so we would have got it from there and then also kind of contacting local record centers other organizations that record different species and trying to pull, pull in data that way so it kind of when we're doing big projects like that comes in from sort of all over the the place which is you know really important to be able to get it's you know it's so important to us to you know particularly with our mammal mapper data and things like that for this information to be available for people who are doing research so that you can just go on and see these records so that you know it helps inform research so yeah a lot a lot of our data we get in from mammal mapper so that's a really handy way for people to be able to record species that they see so it's free to download on your phone and and then you just type in your email and your name so it's got it knows where the records have come from um, and then you can either submit one-off sightings when you see them. So maybe you saw a fox outside <laughs> in the road or something, you could just quickly um, record it or you can um, do a survey. So you can start survey, put the phone in your pocket and then just get it out if you spot any signs or if you spot a mammal or anything like that. So that's a really interesting um, new way of allowing people to record what they see because we also get an idea of why you didn't see things, which sounds silly, but you know, no data is absolutely still data. And it's really important to know, you know, not just where you saw something, but where you walked and you didn't see anything. Yeah. And also for how how long you were you were out walking about before you saw something. And um, it's what we call effort. So it's how long did you, you know, how far did you walk? How long were you out before you actually spotted anything? It's also really useful and interesting information on top of the actual sighting itself. And um, so that's been really useful, um, yeah, to, to get access to that data. How long has it actually been up and running, the, the, the app itself? And do you know how many users you've got? Yeah, so um, we've got just under 5,000 members using the app now, which is, which is really cool. And yeah, um, great to have so many people using it and coming in all the time. Um, and yeah, the records that they bring in are, you know, a, a good mix of, you know, one-off sightings are also doing these surveys and finding finding things along the way. So um, yeah, it's good to have people using, using the app more and more all the time. I can imagine this being a bit like I don't know whether you came across it. It used to be really in. I don't know whether people still do it. They used to call it caching. You'd go off with your family and um, it was like a treasure hunt. People would put things in certain places. I feel like that this this app has that sort of potential, but it, it brings a whole new action and activity to a family walk. Uh, it just needs, yeah. people just need to know about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's quite interesting because when you start looking, you know, because it's not just the mammals themselves, but you can also record the signs you see. So suddenly you're like, look, you know, looking everywhere. Like, can you see any footprints, any markings anywhere where something's gone through, any burrows, that type of thing. So, yeah, it is. It is just trying to, you know, encourage people to to use it, to download it. Also to to kind of let people know that it's really important what they see a lot of the species that are under recorded the things that you think probably actually people see quite a lot but you sort of don't realize you know maybe things like rabbits or moles in some places actually um but you think people probably see mole pills they're quite an easy sign to spot but sometimes it's realizing that you actually do need the records i found that when i was doing my um underground on hedgehogs actually there weren't a huge number of hedgehogs recorded with the record center in guernsey but once you actually start asking people, you know, oh, let me know when you see a hedgehog, suddenly everyone's like, oh, I get five in my garden, you haven't had them for years, kind of thing. So it's just sort of, yeah, reaching people, which can be difficult, you know, as a small charity, we're trying to reach of people all the time online and through social media or, you know, through emailing them on our e-bulletins and things like that. So um, it's really trying to yeah, reach as wide an audience as possible. Yeah, it's an interesting point that you make about people 
oh, I've seen all those things and therefore <laughs> I don't need to report them. Whereas, oh, let's let's find the thing that I never see. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's complex research, isn't it? it? You've really got to make sure everyone knows what the rules are to be able to collect really excellent, uh, valuable data when they're self-reporting, don't you? Yeah, yeah, and that's the nice thing about Mammal Macro as well is that you kind of really just take you step by step through exactly what information we, we want to know. So you know, and you know, it's all very kind of straightforward that you would you would know. But yeah, it's just so that you don't have to worry about oh, should I've included this or you know, do they need to know this or do they not? Um, and the other nice thing is pictures as well because we um you can you can upload photos on the app, which is really useful for verifiers. So every record goes to a county verifier and they look at it and say, you know, okay, yes, you know, there's a picture. Yes, I can see that is what they saw, tick. Um, or, you know, okay, yeah, they probably they probably did see the hedgehog, you know, but, we'll, you know, there's lots of different degrees of like certain, you know, probably correct, you know, all this, all this, yeah. and all these different levels. So yeah, uh, being able to include photos is really helpful for, for the verifiers to see what you've seen. And I wonder whether the app always also perhaps allows people to engage with animals that they might have thought differently about. And what I mean by that is, is the same, I come across then um, when people talk about dandelions, it's they either see it as a weed or a, or a, mm-hmm. a nice wild flower. And it's the same, I think, with small mammals. You could potentially think, oh, pest, don't want those in my garden. Or, oh, look, isn't that lovely? A four-legged <laughs> friend has come to see me. Uh, I wonder whether people, when they start looking for these things, whether it changes their perception. I'm just putting that out there, really. But anything, anything in my mind that helps people connect with mammals to want them to conserve it seems like a really positive positive yeah. thing and on the back of that you know what does does it really matter if we lose one of these species if they go extinct i mean yeah it, it does for there's a number of reasons yeah that one's always a tricky you know you ask someone like, well why why does it matter but, you know there's there's things like so we could look at it from sort of the ecosystem level so you've got sort of an ecosystem where um, you've got all your sort of your plants, your insects, your mammals, your birds, everything sort of working in a system together. Um, and if you lose some something from that system, then suddenly that that affects how it works. Maybe, you know, suddenly something is not predating on the things it used to be. So they're, you know, maybe eating more of the plants, the plants are changing, you know, there's all sorts of bits that kind of change about that. And um, something that sort of follows on from that bit is um, ecosystem services, which is what we call the things that ecosystems produce that benefit us. So one that comes up a lot is pollination. So, you know, we get we have pollinators. We often talk about bees and wasps and butterflies pollinating our crops that we, we need to eat. Um, but small mammals also act as pollinators as well. So you think if you lose some of those species, then that is going to affect that as well. And then there's also the one that I prefer really is the intrinsic value of something. So saying that, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to have a purpose or a reason for us to say, well, why does it matter? It just, you know, it has a right to be here like everything else. It matters because it is there, you know, in its own right. It doesn't need to provide us a service in order to be worth conserving. <laughs> and so there's that aspect as well. So there's, yeah, lots of different ways you can, you can look at that question. Yeah, and I really like that that last that last point you make, valuing it because it's a living being that we share our planet with, and mm-hmm. it, as yeah. you say, doesn't necessarily have to di- give us a direct service. Although all of our animals, in, you know, do in some way give us give us something. But yeah, that that's a really nice way of looking at it. Yeah. So, in in terms of, um, I mean, you seem like a really positive person, and you're working in a field where you see quite a lot of decline and it's quite depressing what do, or can be quite depressing um, how do you how do you how do you stay positive about it what, what do you see as a future that that's bright uh, that the difference perhaps that the society can make yeah I guess positive things I mean yeah it's things like when you see people take an interest in wildlife and wanting to do something about it I feel like as well with COVID everybody being stuck indoors people were sort of looking out of their window a bit more and seeing what was out there and and kind of wanting to know more about it and maybe wanting to you know suddenly you can't so now you want to go outside (laughs) you want to go outside and, and see things so seeing people changing their opinions and wanting to you know 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 how they can help wanting to find out more about wildlife in their areas um 
is positive. I think it's really nice to see people, um, you know, caring in that way. Um, I think just, yeah, also the, the increase in recording and citizen science that's going on at the moment is also really encouraging that there is a way that people can get involved with recording and it's easier to do all the time and just getting people more involved with, with that and more informed. So yeah, that's, that's also, um, yeah, really, really nice to see. I feel like just getting out in nature as well is a way of staying positive for me sometimes, just sort of spending some time outside and, you know, appreciating what's out there and, you know, reminding yourself of why you do it, <laughs> why you want to do it when it's when it's yeah. a bit depressing and you're seeing all the, you know, the red lists come out and things like that. So. And does it give you, I guess you're quite tuned in to when you're out and about for looking for, for mammals, do you still get a kick out of seeing a mammal in out when you're out and about? Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> so, I guess growing up in, so I, I didn't come to live in the UK till I was 20 because that's when I went to Swansea. Um, and in Guernsey, we don't have a huge number of mammals. We're lucky that we have, we got a lot of hedgehogs about. They are, they're all over the place in the summer. So that's nice. And then we've got rabbits and, you know, Guernsey bowl, wood mouse, that type of thing. And, and we've got some bat species, but, you know, we don't have Squir squirrels of any kind I was excited just to see a grey squirrel when I went to university to be honest I think my housemates thought I was a bit mad but yeah just that suddenly knowing that they're out there and the possibility that you might see all these different species I still remember when I saw my first red fox it was um, a friend of mine who did photography he was going out and um from his car like taking pictures of these foxes and um, trying to get kind of Swansea city in the background and I went out with him one day and my my head nearly hit the windscreen <laughs> when this beautiful fox came across the the headland it was just there it was um yeah crazy and yeah anytime when I I see them still even just sort of I live in Brighton now sometimes you see them around the you know the, the quieter streets and things and it's just so yeah so exciting um, and I, I said to myself actually that next year I'm going to try and see as many British mammals as I can I'm going to set that as my not a resolution but kind of as a goal for next year I'm going to try and see as many in person as I possibly can that seems like a really nice <laughs> nice 2022 goal I like that yeah uh, perhaps we could all embrace that and all get in <laughs> in tune with the mammals that we have in the countryside have you have you got a favorite have you got one on your wish list I really would like to see a particular oh, mammal I say my my absolute favorite is probably still a red fox. I just I love seeing them and yeah, how they've adapted to live alongside in and alongside of the urban environments and stuff. I think it's so so interesting and they're great. Um, oh, wish list of what I want to see. I feel like it would be amazing to see a badger. I feel like they've eluded me a few times. I've seen kind of the the fur about, or I've seen the paw print, and I know there was a set um, near us at university, but I never actually saw them. So I feel like that one is one that I um, would love to see. Um, but yes, yeah, so many. Um, we we went to Mull a couple of years ago, and um, there's otter because up in Scotland they they come out a bit more in the day along the coast. I think. Freshwater in the UK, it's a bit trickier because they're often more more about at night, but up there they do come out a bit more in the day. Um, but we were unlucky at every turn, didn't see one. So <laughs> that would be- You awesome. have to go again. <laughs> yeah, yes. oh no, I'm gonna have to go back to Mull. <laughs> From Brighton, that's quite a trip. That's a road yeah. trip. <laughs> Or a train trip, even. Yeah. <laughs> well, as a society, where's where's the next? Is there is there a, an ultimate vision, or is there a place that the uh, a direction of travel for the society as a whole, or is it going to remain the same in terms of recording and sharing the data? Um. So yeah, I think you know, making sure that people are you know informed about how you can record and, and monitoring is still going to be a really important part of the society. But we are going through a really exciting transition at the moment, where you know we've just had a CEO Andy start, and we're kind of having a look at a new a new plan for the next sort of you know five years or so of what's going on, and then um, starting to think about where where we're going and things. And yeah, it's exciting. I mean, there's a, a few projects on the horizon, and I think something we really want to start doing as well is you know more of the kind of what can what can you do with this research that we're finding what can what can we all do to kind of help these these things so yeah that's that's something that's in, it's going to be good to sort of really get into a bit more and, and coming up with these kind of ways that people can you know make yeah. these changes and stuff so and um, that's that's exciting yeah very much so because especially as you um are able to perhaps reach more people in different ways mm. to connect them 
to inform them, to get them involved in collecting data, and then say, oh, how about not mowing that bit of the edge of the lawn or mm -hmm. thinking about where your hedgehog might be able to get through to your neighbour, that sort of stuff. Um, it's it's there's, the, the potential is huge, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and because you find that, you know, people want to do things, you know, they want to do mm. things to help, but sometimes you don't know what to what do. That is. That everything it seems such a big problem or you just feel like what can you do to even start to help so yeah just coming up with this more is it's going to be good and, and yeah hearing how people get on with different because that's the great thing about social media as well and also the email account you know you get to engage and find out how people are getting on what they're thinking and you know it's been good with things like the the survey um the harvest mice that are doing at the moment when you get pictures of people who have been out surveying and you get pictures of someone pointing at the nest or like a group of people all gathered around a nest or something it's really nice to see um people being able to get involved in, in stuff and, and really helping um, and in terms of the harvest mouse survey how long is that running for so it's running over, so it started in September and it's running to March now, um, because basically the, the way that you sort of survey for them is looking for their breeding nests, which are about the size of a tennis ball. And, you know, when it's autumn and winter period and they're not breeding so much anymore and the vegetation's died back a bit, you can actually see the nests a bit more easily. And that's, that's when we kind of look for them. So um, it goes till about March because you also kind of get the weather playing a bit into it. So if you get a particularly rainy, windy season, sometimes you suddenly can't find these nests anymore because they, you know, the weather's taking care of it. So um, yeah, running till March, but we're hoping to run it again next year as well. Because um, something you find with harvest mice is their populations tend to fluctuate year on year anyway. So one year you might go to a site and there'll be one or two nests, and then the next year there'll be absolutely loads. But it's just sort of because that's sort of how it naturally goes for them sometimes. So it's good to get more than one sort of survey in um, so that you can get a better idea of, of what that means and whether, you know, yeah, you have a long term. good or about it. You can sort of guess maybe, <laughs> maybe yeah. whether you might be. But um, yeah, it's good to get um, more, more data in. So yeah, um, we're still looking for volunteers as well. Um, so if anyone's interested, they can so drop me an email or it's on our website and things like that. And if we've got coordinators in their area, then I can put them in touch. and. Um, see if they can get out and do some. I'm excited to do some. We don't have harvest mice in Guernsey, so while I was at home, I couldn't get involved. But now I've moved back to the UK. I'm like, right, it's time to go look. <laughs> do Excellent. some harvest service. <laughs> and are there other projects that the members of the public can get involved in? Obviously, Mammal Mapper is always mm. something that we'd love to people to do. Um, we had, we did have. It's just, just kind of got to the edge where we, we stopped it to collect the, you know, analyze the data and things now. But we did have one about mountain hares in Scotland. So it was particularly for people going to the sort of Scottish uplands and to use mammal mapper to record mountain hares or signs of them, um, but also upland birds as well. We were working with um, Nature Scott, the British Trust for Ornithology, um, the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust and the James Hutton Institute on that one. So it was more of a collaborative one, um, but it's just, yeah, just stop the, just stop the data now. And obviously you had to be in, in Scotland, <laughs> Scotland to help with that. But we do have a few, a few bits hopefully on the horizon for next year to, to let people know about. But um, yeah, at the, at the moment, it's mainly pushing the Harvest Mouth survey and yeah. Recording nice. on, on the mapper and things like that but cool. yeah there's there's always bits coming in so yeah excellent uh so looking long term how hopeful are you what do you see the in 2050 what would the state of mammals look like do you think or you hope it will look like by then yeah it's tricky isn't it mm. i mean i hope it will have improved <laughs> improved um i mean it's nice to see um you know people engaging with it more and more and you know yeah, it's, it's a difficult one, though, because there's so many factors playing in and um, a lot of the time, you know, you really are also relying on these, you know, certain species that are in trouble to be protected and, you know, for there to be projects in place to be helping and supporting different species. Um, and there's obviously the climate is a big one as well, you know, how that is affecting things. And um, so it, it is really hard to know a lot of a lot of species, you know, are, you know, do need do need some help, really. So it's it's difficult to to know how it's going to go but you know it you know things are I think improving all the time as far as the projects going on the the research how what we're learning um how you know how to do things better there's always that so yeah I guess we'll have to to see I don't know whether that sounds positive or negative <laughs> <laughs> well you, you say everything with a smile so Charlie I'm going to take that as a positive <laughs> uh, and finally then uh how does your you, you know you work 
with mammals and uh, in this sector, and you've done lots of research to date. How has that informed? Has it has it informed your personal life? Uh, have you become more aware, just generally, of environmental issues, and have you, has that influenced what you do? Um, yeah, I think so. Like in my day to day, I definitely am conscious of trying to do things that you know less of an impact on the environment and things like that. I I finally did bite the bullet and go vegetarian last year so sort of doing all making all these little choices um you know it took a while to get there for a long time I was sort of like bit by bit slowly yeah. like getting there but that you know that's that's fine it's yeah trying to do do more all the time but you know it's just doing things at your own pace isn't it sometimes of um, course yeah and I, I I mean I, I wouldn't say that's a little move if you've been a uh, an mm. omnivore before and now you've gone vegetarian I think that's quite a, you know that's quite a big step in someone's life to make that that change yeah. Yeah, and I don't miss it actually. I, I think people, I was always, you know, you always worry that you're going to miss like one particular thing, or but it's um, yeah, it's fine. I don't know if I'd brave veganism yet. I think that I, I don't know if I could do without like milk chocolate and cheese and things. That's hard, but um, no judgment uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Charlie, yeah. it's been absolutely lovely talking to you, um, mm -hmm. and I've I've learned a lot. And there's, uh, I, yeah, I think there's a lot to take away in terms of. The more people get on board and get more in touch with what's out there, then mm -hmm. I think that's got to be a positive thing because people will buy into protecting something they, they then value more. Yeah, so you've, yeah. defi you've definitely provided that voice of get out there and find these mammals. <laughs> yeah, it's so it's so important, and yeah, even if you think you don't you don't see anything, or you know, it's, yeah, it really we still really want to know if you didn't see anything. <laughs> um, yeah, it's you know the more more we know you know the better the estimate you know the better the population estimates are the better the distribution estimate, you know and then we know where they are where they're not how they're doing it's it's all you know that is the foundation for knowing how best to conserve things or what the problem is where the problem is you know so yeah it's it's really important great so the message is record everything even yes. if nothing <laughs> is there excellent well thank you very much and uh yeah, thank you yeah. for having me you're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. What a lovely chat I had with Charlie, discovering how the Mammal Society is providing essential knowledge about the state of British mammal populations so that we can ensure we don't lose these precious species. I think the Mammal Mapper app is a fabulous way to get more people curious and engaged in the wildlife in our green spaces, seeking them out to gauge their habitats and numbers. It's a great activity for all the family when out walking in nature. I've used the app and it's super easy to navigate, so I would definitely recommend taking a look. A link can be found in the show notes. I'd like to thank Andy Shaw for audio editing, Jeremy Jones for providing the music, and to you, of course, for listening. Don't forget, you can subscribe to get automatic access to each new episode. And it would be lovely if you could rate, review and share the podcast too. It really helps. Until next time. Bye for now.